Hey everyone, this is Samantha Farley with the Type 1 Tribe, an interview series with T1D leaders all across the world. Today, our guest is Tom Allison, a coach for Type 1 diabetics who also lives with, lives with Type 1 diabetes himself. So thanks for, so much for being here, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Um, I always love doing podcasts, obviously, with my own and that. I love talking and people probably say that I can talk too much. To be honest, but thanks for having me on. <laughs> That's great. I love when people talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about you. Where are you from? Where do you live now? So I'm from the UK, as we were just chatting then. <laughs> uh, excuse me with the pre-show. Um, Manchester's always the place that I say, even though I'm not in Manchester, but everyone all over the world, like, oh, you're Manchester United, Manchester City. From around Manchester, about an hour out, as I said to you, it's like in the countryside, like it's beautiful. I'm a country boy, me. I love it. So that's where I'm from. And I've been here for, I'm 36 now. I uh, lived around here the whole of my life. So that's awesome. Are you a Manchester United fan? No, Manchester City. Okay. <laughs> Manchester City. There's a bit of a thing going on here in the UK that Manchester United's ground isn't actually in Manchester, whereas Manchester City is. So, oh, <laughs> the rivals, okay. big rivals. <laughs> okay, nice. So, what what do you like to do for fun? For fun, um, it sounds weird, like we're, we're being a coach, but obviously exercise. But I love riding my push bike, going running. I've got a seventeen month old border collie. Who I take on what he's like oh. a bloody kid. Like sometimes I'm like Steve. He's called Steve. Like sometimes I'm like Steve when he's winding me up. But he's a great companion. So spending time with him, um, and I really like music house and techno sort of music so I've got a set of decks I've just got into producing music so quite a lot of things that I enjoy and a big one for me and I always say this to for us as like type ones is anything really that can stop me thinking about type 1 diabetes to be honest with you because it's a good stress release absolutely and I agree with the exercise part that always helps I mean obviously sometimes cardio can complicate things with diabetes but it does help relieve the stress of diabetes for mm -hmm. sure and your dog named Steve, that is so cute. Steve, everyone, you know, when we're out on walks and um, people are like, oh my God, your dog's so cute. Like, what's he called? I'm like, it's called Steve. Steve. And they forget my name when they see me again, but they always remember his name. Like, they never forget it. <laughs> is, is it a black and white border collie? Black and white border collie. Yep. Typical oh. looking border collie. Yep. I have a border collie <laughs> mix. So I, I understand they're the best dogs. Amazing. Need a lot of mental and physical stimulation, but absolutely incredible. Best decision ever made getting in. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your type 1 diabetes diagnosis story. Mm, this is a good, I always like telling my, I always like hearing people's as well. So I was a later on, so I was 21, I'm 36 now. I was 21. I've always been into health and fitness. Um, and at the time, I was trying to lose some body fat. So I was doing a low carb sort of day. It's not how you need to do, but at the time I was trying to drop calories and that. Mm -hmm. And I started to feel really tired. And I'm the, uh, over this mindset that I'll push through anything just to get a goal that I want. So I was feeling dead, dead tired and lethargic all the time. And this went on for like a week or so. The next thing, dry mouth, urinating, you're pissing all the time. And I was like, hmm, all right. And there was me drinking water, but also drinking apple and orange juice as well. Not knowing now that we treat a low with that, like, but I didn't know then. Feeling dead lethargic, getting pulled muscles, spasms. And the final nail in the coffin for me was, anyone that's listening to this will know like the blurred vision, but it's like when you wake up in the morning and your eyes are blurred, you rub them, it goes. It stayed like that for two days. And I was like, crap, like I need to go to the doctors here. And my mum used to be a nurse. And she kind of knew, but she didn't want to admit it. So drove myself off to the doctors. They did a finger prick. It come up HI, like not hello, like HI, because it didn't, too off the scale, too, too off the scale um, reading. They went, well, you just go and like, we in this tub for us. They did a dipstick. They said, yeah, you're type 1 diabetic. Go and wait in the waiting room. We're calling you an ambulance. And I was like, oh, shit, like what's type 1 diabetes? Can I not eat sugar again? I'm, I've got a major sweet tooth, me. I love Chinese food. I love Reese's, Biscoff, all that. And I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to eat any of this again. Uh, so I was whisked into hospital. I was in there two nights. They give me a finger prick, long lasting insulin because I was on pens at the time, rapid acting. This is type 1 diabetes. This is what it does. This is what you have to do. See you later. And obviously, my mind was frazzled at the time. I was like, okay, okay, okay. And then just kind of went on. So that was like my diagnosis story in a nutshell. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's crazy. 
And they hopefully, well, how long did it take you to realize you can eat sugar and you can eat whatever you want? Pretty well, when I come, the, 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 the night that I come out of hospital, the day I come out of hospital, what I did that evening was I ordered a Chinese takeout. Um, I ordered a Chinese takeout that night. Little did I know about high fats and all that sort of stuff. So I remember at the time I put what I thought was 14 units in. It was a bit hit and miss. I didn't really know much about it. Um, and I went sky high. So I didn't know anything about eating sugar and really much. I just kind of understood the carbs. But I kind of like did a lot of research and I realized that, hey, I'm not actually going to have to, you know, cut things that I enjoy out. And I, but I think it was only from like research and stuff, really. It, it takes time to like learn all of that information. And it a lot of it is unfortunately trial and error. <laughs> like with the Chinese, you're like, oh shoot, I, that was way higher than I thought I'd be. And it just takes time, unfortunately. So were you, how long were you in the hospital? About two nights, three, three days, two nights. That's so how it was for me too. Yeah, they basically put me on a sliding scale of insulin, a saline solution drip, because obviously you're dehydrated. I can't remember what my levels were when they left when they said I could go, but they said they're a reasonable level now. We can discharge you. See you later. So, do you know what they were when you went in? It was, I'll do the conversion. It was about 35 moles, which is 630 milligram per deciliter. So it was high. But they said, you're not an ill, ill diabetic. I was like, we can feel like it. Like, but I didn't have any ketones, which was weird. That so, is weird. Hmm. Were you exercising a lot back then too? Yeah. I think I was exercising up until like three days before I went to the doctors and I was diagnosed. So I wonder if that's why, like maybe that was helping flush out. Yeah, probably, yeah, helping flush and with all obviously like the water, probably not the apple and orange juice was helping, but you know, <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> wow, that's that's so interesting. And so now it's been what, thir- how long? 15 years? 15 years. Yeah, 15 years now. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. It's been a while, but saying that, like, I think that's quite long. But then I speak to people and like, I've had it fifty years. I'm like, oh my god, like, yeah. And that's th- those stories are amazing because you know when they were, if they were younger, when they had it, we didn't have all the technology back then, so oh. they really deserve the credit. Yeah, yeah, they did. There's a lady who uh, coaches for me, and she's had it years and years, and she remembers so much. Like when everything started, the finger pricks were massive. They were like big pinches and. You know, like the injection needles, put insulin in was huge. And yeah, we've come a hell of a long way, hell of a long way. Which is great. <laughs> so what's your uh, favorite low snack? My favorite low snack. I was thinking about this last night, you know, and you see the flip side is I try to not get any sort of hypo treatments in that I really like because I just eat them even mm-hmm. when I'm not low. So <laughs> but it used to be jelly babies. First of all, like a lot of tight ones. I was given Lucozay tablets. I don't know if you get these in the States. So like really chalky or dextrose tablets. Yeah, glucose tablets. Is yeah, what basically, do. yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I probably lasted on them for a month and I was like, this is like eating chalk. I don't like it. So the more research that I kind of had to do, um, I went on to like Jelly Babies. And then now I'm on drumstick squashies. I don't know if you get them there. I don't know what that is. You know what Jelly Babies are? You get Jelly Babies, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are like... It's basically, it's hard to describe. It's basically very similar to a jelly baby in terms of like the carbs and stuff like that. Um, okay. But it tastes a little bit nicer because I had jelly babies for years. I got bored of them. So, but okay. I try and avoid anything that, I try and avoid anything high in fat because it doesn't work fast. I right, a bit of a tip there for everyone. And I try and avoid every, anything that I really do enjoy the taste of because like I say, I'll just end up eating them. <laughs> yeah. And that's important what you just said about the fat because a lot of people when you're first diagnosed you're like oh my god I just have to eat sugar and you grab cookies and things like that where you're like wait my blood sugar is not coming up like why is it not coming yeah. up and it's because of the fat but that's yeah. why I, I stick with glucose tablets because yeah. they will I know they work within 15 minutes and so I just like having those but I, I get what you're saying about the chalkiness <laughs> yeah <laughs> the drinks are good as well I always find liquids are a really good one as I said apple orange juice Lucas aids that sort of yeah. stuff like not the sports but yeah apples and orange juice good ones do you have a favorite like blood sugar friendly snack that you like to eat um Something not like spike your blood sugar. you mean that doesn't define blood sugar friendly what you something class. that wouldn't necessarily spike your blood sugar like you might still have to take insulin for it but something hmm. that doesn't you know no like <laughs> i'll i'll be straight up like I cover bases of eating as long as I'm eating nutrition and stuff like that. Like 
and I want something if I want pizza or anything like that, get the bolus right, absolutely fine. Like with it, I know some tight ones could come under the impression like I'm just going to have some protein or some fats. And the caveat to that is understanding that they can still convert to glucose, which might be a tip for some tight ones as well, especially if it's a high protein meal or a high fat meal, still probably going to have to bolus, bolus some insulin, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. So kind of I'll eat not what I want. I eat well because of obviously my job, my health and fitness and stuff like that. But there's never a specific food that I go to in terms of managing my levels. The flip side to that is this. If I'm ill, if some, if my levels are becoming really challenging to control, I will go low carb. For me personally, it's the only time I go low carb because it seems pointless in eating carbs, putting more glucose in the blood when there's already a lot anyway. Take that variable out, give yourself a better chance of success of bringing your levels down. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. So tell us a little bit more about your coaching practice. What exactly do you do? So basically in a nutshell, we've got a hashtag on this is changing the lives of type 1 diabetics. That's an overarching thing. What we would do, we work with type 1s all across the spectrum. Some have got really like poor control. Some have got quite good control. They just want to tighten it up. But we basically, it's hard to describe it that much in our program, providing support, knowledge, exercise, nutrition, things specifically around type 1 diabetes and stuff like that as well. So they can ultimately have great numbers. By great numbers, the goals that we set for everyone is getting an A1C to 6.5% or below, which is 47. An average blood glucose of about, I think, in, it's around like 5 to 6, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, is about 108 to 120 milligram per deciliter. So we're looking Sounds at. Great. Mm-hmm. And anything over 70% or above time in target range, this is what we set. But not just for numbers, because let's be honest, we don't just want the numbers. We want what these numbers are going to allow us to achieve and to do with our life. And for some females, that might be have kids. It might be excel in a career. It might be feel better. It might be avoid long-term health complications, whatever it is. I think we're all on that spectrum of avoiding long-term health complications. Mm-hmm. I see our blood sugar control as like the plate that our life spins on. And if it's cracked, things are going to start falling through. So for me and for all of our clients, that is number one priority. And we just basically help them get to that level. That makes sense. That's, yeah, that's amazing. So, well, I don't, I don't want you to share anyone's personal stories, but like, can you give an example of somebody's story that came in and then like what you did for them? Cause I'm just curious. So we can have clients coming in with like quite high A1Cs. Um, and not really understanding much. Some to the point where they don't understand how to do a basal rate test or an insulin to carb ratio test or things like that. Do you know what I mean? Um, and let's say they've got a really high HbA1c. Like some have been like, the thing is with this, you need acceptance and you need to be able to hold your hands up and say, I'm not doing the best that I can. Until someone can say that, a coach or no one can help them. And these people that come in like will say that and they say, but I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to put the work in. This is where quite a lot of our clients come from. And it's hard to say like specific stories because everyone's so personal and so different. But we've had plenty of clients coming in with an A1C of like over 100, which we're looking at like 11, 12, 13%. And we've managed to half that like down as well. Not just that's not the be all and end all because you've not done it by having a lot of lows. So the time in target range has gone up. But it's hearing the words from people like, oh my God, you've changed my life. And I actually understand the knowledge and the specifics behind it. Because that's what it takes. It's a skill at the end of the day. That's the way I say it. And that's why I try and teach it to my clients. Doing a squat, riding a bike, like I said before, learning to DJ, the skills. And when you first try it, you probably ain't going to be that damn good at it. But the more that you can put the work in, you can put the reps in, same with workouts at the gym, you're going to get better and you're going to get better as well. So that's the way that we see it. I know I didn't give a specific story of a specific client there, but hopefully you've got an overarching view of kind of what we do with it. Is the coaching one-on-one group coaching or is it like a one-on-one one-on-one? So I'm very big on one-on-one coaching. The reason for that is this type one diabetes is specific and personal to each individual. We've built out a course, which will take them through like a blueprint of how to run certain tests. But when an individual type one goes and applies the blueprint, they will get an issue that's personal and specific to them that I can't do a training for. And this is where they need that one-to-one support from the coach and the accountability We do have group sides, so we've got our private Facebook group. We have a weekly workshop every Wednesday because community is huge for us as type ones as well. You need to be surrounded with other type ones to see that other people they they go through certain struggles as well. A positive, good, uplifting community, so people realize that hey, I'm not in this journey on my own. Right. 
And that's crucial for type ones. Cause yeah. I mean, you know, most people don't have it. So sometimes you feel alone. So it's great mm. to have a community like that. Mm. How long Definitely. have you been doing this? So I have been a personal trainer. I started out just helping people lose body fat, build muscle when I was 22. A little bit of a side story. I didn't really know what I wanted to do in my life before I was 21 when I got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I was working security, working the doors, dead-end jobs. I did so much different things. When I got this, I was like, crap, right, this is a bit of a change to my life. I best uh, pull my finger out my bum a little bit and decide what I want to do in my life. So I was like, right. And I'd always enjoyed the gym, like I say, at the end of school, like 16, 17. But I never pursued it as a career. And then I was like, right, I enjoy the gym. I've got this lifelong condition. I'm going to go for it. So I've got all my qualifications, started as a personal trainer. And then seven years ago, basically sacked off all the clients that weren't type one and said, I'm just coaching type ones. So like a good few years, I think since I was 22, but specifically seven years with just type ones. Wow. And you do this full time? Full time. Yep. So it's a company now. I've got two coaches that coach for myself. Uh, we've got someone in our Facebook group that's helping support them and stuff like that. So yeah, proper company, oh proper gosh. business. That's um, amazing. At, the, at the moment, we've got 46 clients. Over the seven years, we've helped over 500 type 1 diabetics. And I've got a board behind me of everyone's A1C that we've got to 6.5% or below. Every single client goes on that board. That's awesome. And you help people all over the world? All over the world. All over the world. We've got, we've got clients. So I'm curious, just because I know, you know, it's a little different in every country of how things work and the, uh, you know, the, the tools we use to manage our blood sugars and all that. So like, how does that for you as a coach, like, does that change anything or is it basically just following the basics? Yeah, it's like, I'm under the impression that it's skills and knowledge that an individual needs with those skills and knowledge, you could manage your blood sugars with bare minimum. By bare minimum, we mean in a finger prick and injections. That's bare minimum. Every single type of diabetic across the world, I think, will get that. In certain countries, they might get limited on test strips and stuff like that. I understand that. or paying for certain things. We're very lucky over the NHS. We get like free prescriptions with like healthcare and stuff like that. But it's those with a bare minimum. If you've got the skills and knowledge, I just see everything like a CGM or a pump. These are just tools and a vehicle. You've got to have the skills and knowledge to adapt to be able to input that. So what we teach enable our clients to achieve great control regardless we've got people on finger pricks we've just pens you know injections they're still achieving great control and it's down to the skills and knowledge at the end of the day so well i'm curious what do you use any like diabetes tools for yourself yeah so i've got a pump i use a tandem t slim two and a freestyle libra that's what nice. i use as well as my finger pricks because a big tip for any type one out there Nothing will replace finger pricks as yet. It's never going to be as accurate, especially around exercise. So I always still prick my finger. Usually in the morning, when I'm feeling a little bit funny, if I think it might be low or higher, if I scan my arm and it's giving me a reading I'm not too sure on, I'll test it on my finger prick and always around exercise as well. I usually prick like at least once a week as well, just to make sure yeah. everything's right. Because I've, I've had my, I wear a Dexcom and I've had that off like by like 40 mm. points. So, so you want to make sure it's correct. Yeah, so you're not you low and then think you're high especially when we're going like high or low so if anyone like you know looks at your dexcom you scan your libra and it's a high or low reading test it against the finger prick because these even though these machines are great they're more accurate when we're in range when we start to go out of range they're marred which is how they measure the accuracy will start to go out and it can sometimes be quite a bit so a bit of a tip there for anyone oh i did not know that i guess it makes sense though Interesting. Do you have a story, like a, a scary low that you ever had? Do you have a story around that? Yeah, I actually did a reel on my Instagram of this the other day. So it was, I used to do scaffolding labor and I think I'd just been diagnosed and I'd, I was doing my PT qualifications. I'd not actually got into the industry yet. I used to do scaffolding labor and I remember being on the back of a scaffolding wagon and we didn't have a Dexcom or a Libra then, but this was way years ago. Mm -hmm. um, probably looking at, oh, it must have been like 13, 14 years ago on the back of a scaffolding wagon, unloading the scaffolding wagon. And I remember saying to the lads, lads, I feel a little bit funny. And he was like, mm, are you all right? I said, uh, give me a minute. I'm just going to check my uh, check my blood sugar levels. And he was like, right, okay. So I pricked my finger and my level, are you ready for this? This is the lowest of a minute, it's scary. Was 0 0.8 moles, which is 14.4 milligram per deciliter. Oof. That was, but the funny thing is, 
I didn't actually, I, f- I felt the low, but not really low. And I wasn't crapping myself until I seen that number. That's when I was like, oh my God. And I started to worry. Cause it's the lowest I've been. I was relatively newly diagnosed a year or so in. I was like, oh shit, like that's low. Uh, managed to obviously sort myself out, but that that was the scariest low that, that I've ever had. It was more scary when I seen the number. I think when we see the numbers, this is when it starts playing with your head a little bit. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, because sometimes you feel it, sometimes you don't, and mm. which is scary. But yeah. yeah, then you see the number, you're like, holy crap, I have to go eat some sugar <laughs> or whatever, drink some juice. Oh man, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Mm. <laughs> So what do you think the future of type one diabetes looks like? Whether that's like the technology or whether you think mm. more people are going to be diagnosed or anything related to that? I know in, st- in terms of the st- uh, t- uh, like statistics here in the UK, I think about 90, 95% of diabetics are type two, five mm-hmm. or 10% are type ones. Mm-hmm. So it's a very small pool of the diabetic community. I'm not sure what it is like in other countries or in the States, probably going to be similar. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure if more people will be diagnosed. The, the way that I want it to go, I love diabetes tech. But like I said at the start, give people the skills, give people the knowledge, give people the education, because what if diabetes tech broke tomorrow and we only had a finger prick and we only had injections, you still need the knowledge to control it. Mm-hmm. which is the way that I, I know they're coming up with Bayes like you and, oh, you know, closed loops, you know, like your auto pancreas and stuff like, which is great, but get the algorithm good, better than what they're at now. Cause for me personally, I think shit for me personally, get them a good algorithm because at the moment, I don't think they replace someone's brain with that much knowledge. We know our bodies. We know how we feel better than an algorithm. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm all for diabetes tech, I'm so, so grateful. And we are so blessed what we've got mm-hmm. access to now. But that's how I see with that. I'd like the education to come up more, the education system. And a big thing that I think needs more awareness around it, which we're big on with clients, is people's mindset, especially upon diagnosis, because it's hard and it's heavy. People need to be helped in terms of the mindset and the acceptance side of it. Even if they've had it as a kid, rebellious teenagers, not doing stuff because they want to be like their mates. Like They needs more help and pathways for the psychological responses of type ones and stuff like that as well. So it's great having all the tech, but think about people's brains and how they feel. I think that needs to be developed in the future as well. I 100% agree. <laughs> I, I had a pretty bad experience with that side of it too in the hospital. Like just doctors telling me I couldn't do things, you know, now yeah. that I'm diagnosed and little stuff like that where I'm like, what, you know? And so mm-hmm. even that, like, it sounds bad, but doctors need to be educated on the lifestyle port- side of diabetes, not only the medical side. Yeah, definitely, totally agree with that. And some of the stories that we hear from, our clients who come on board the program that their DSN or their endo the diabetic specialist nurse in the UK have said to them, I'm like, Oh my God. Like, I can't believe you said that things like, Oh, you're taking quite a lot of insulin. That's bad. To, this is things that bring on things like diabolemia and stuff like that. You can't say that to people mm-hmm. and people need as much insulin as they need to stay alive. Everyone's different. And I make them known, but if someone's not got that much knowledge or skill set around it, and someone who they're looking up to is saying this to them, it's a really bad mental imprint. Some of them are amazing. Some of the things that were amazing. Some of our clients go like, oh my God, who's this guy that you're working with and stuff like that. this? Is amazing, really, really happy that you've got great control. But some of them aren't so good. And I think the education for the nurses needs to have it on a whole. And you know what? I know no one will change this, but you know what I think a big part of it is? A lot of them don't have it. And if you don't have it, you cannot emotionally connect with an individual with a condition that you've never experienced because you've never experienced a high point at 4 a.m. and you go into the cupboards and you're raiding the pissing cupboards. Do you know what I mean? It's things like that, that the emotional connection that you have with someone when they've got it. Some of these people don't. 100%. They're, they're great at the education side, but once you bring up anything personal, they don't understand. And yeah. yeah. And I can't believe they said that about the insulin. Insulin's not a oh. bad thing. You can take as much as you need. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, we've had people saying that my specialist said if I bowl this more insulin, I'm going to get fat. I'm like, oh my God. For anyone listening, insulin doesn't cause weight gain, eating too many calories does. But so I don't understand how these people are like, you can't say that to people. Like there's enough mental health conditions and conditions like diabolemia and, you know, people being scared of insulin and that. It's just adding fuel to the fire. And I really, I despise it to be honest. So yeah, yeah, I agree. So what's one piece of advice you'd give someone who's recently diagnosed? Sit in it for a while and accept it. That's it. Because it's all right me saying, go and educate yourself and that slide 
line if we've got time a story on myself i'm a very obsessive person anything that i put my mind to i will find out all the information i can when i was diagnosed i was like right there was no cultures like myself there's no communities i was like i'm gonna find out all i can my dsm was absolutely crap she reversed into my car once i lost all faith in her when she comes to my house with that i was like right i'm gonna learn as much as i possibly can about the condition i did really well enough to build the program that we've got on stuff like now always learning though but i did really well but one thing that I didn't do so well was sit there, feel what I was feeling, go through it and accept it. And about a year down the line, I hit my first bout of depression. And I think a big line of that is because I didn't sit and feel the life change, what I was going through. So anyone that's just been diagnosed, you're okay to feel, oh my God, my life's changed. You know, this is really bad. Why me? And I'll go through whatever you're feeling, but then no, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Stay in that for as long as you need to accept it. You know what I mean? And then start getting education and knowledge around the condition. But accept it first and stay and realize it's all right to feel down. It's all right. Do you know what I mean? That you're not understanding things. Don't feel stupid if you don't know certain things. But I think that's the biggest bit of advice because I think that comes down to mindset and everything stems from your mindset after that. And it's, I, I've heard there's several people that they have, you have to go through like the death process, the loss, loss process, you know, of like, feeling better again. And that takes time. It's different for everyone. So you're right. It, you probably will feel sad and confused and upset, mm. but it's normal. Yeah, definitely. And like the way that I see it is we got two pathways. Those are tight ones. We can sit and keep on the victimized mindset. Why me bury our head in the sands, try and, you know, forget about it. Or we can use it to empower us and be the reason why we have to succeed at everything that we do in life. That's the way that I see it. it it's the fuel for the fire for me. And I just try and get people like clients or anyone that follows me on anything or comes into my world at all. If I can split the switch to that mindset, then that's job done for me. Like, I love it. I love what you're doing. That's amazing. So how do people find you if they want to get in touch with you? So you can find me on Instagram at type one underscore Tom. I'm always open to DMs and questions and stuff like that as well. I'm always up for a chat. Do you know what I mean? So Instagram at type one underscore Tom. Tom Allison on Facebook, that's my personal profile. And they also have a podcast myself, The Type 1 Movement Podcast. That's on Apple, iTunes, and also on Spotify as well. Amazing. I will include all of that below in this podcast. You People can find you and find you on Instagram. Thank you so much for interviewing today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes, you too. Bye.